Hello and good evening. I am speaking on behalf of the Chain Court Theatre Company. We are very happy to be welcoming you to tonight's presentation of The Hitchhiker. It was written by Lucille Fletcher and features performances by Sophie Ziegler, Seraphim Ruven Kenkin, Chelil Tastemir, and Sophia Kanye. Now, I do not want to take anything away before we get started, but let me tell you, this story is one of my personal favorites. All I can say, though, is hold on to your seat, everybody, and enjoy The Hitchhiker. I'm in an auto camp on Route 66, just west of Gallup, New Mexico. If I tell it, maybe it will help me. It will keep me from, from going crazy. But I must tell this quickly. I'm not crazy now. I feel perfectly well, perfectly well, except I'm running a slight temperature. My name is Ronnie Adams. I'm 26 years of age, unmarried, tall, with black hair. I drive a 1966 Thunderbird, license number 6V7989. I was born in Brooklyn. All this I know. I, I know I'm at this moment perfectly sane that it is not me that's gone mad, but something else something utterly beyond my control. But I must speak quickly. At any moment, the link with life may break. This may be the last thing I ever tell on Earth, the last night I ever see the stars. Six days ago, I left Brooklyn to drive to California. Goodbye, honey. Good luck to you, Ron. Goodbye, Dad. Here, give me a kiss and then I'll go. I'll come out with you to the car. No, oh, it's raining. Stay here at the door. Hey, what's this? Tears? I thought you promised me you wouldn't cry. I know, dear. I'm sorry, but I, I do hate to see you go. I'll be back. I'll only be on the coast three months. Oh, it isn't that. It's just the trip, Ronnie. I wish you weren't driving. Oh, Dad. There you go again. People do it every day. I know, but you'll be careful, won't you? Promise me, you'll be extra careful. Don't fall asleep or drive fast or pick up any strangers on the road. Gosh, no. You think I was still 17 to hear you talk. And wire me as soon as you get to Hollywood, won't you, honey? Of course I will. Now, don't you worry. There isn't anything going to happen. It's just eight days of perfectly simple driving on smooth, decent, civilized roads. With a hot dog or a hamburger stand every 10 miles. <laughs> Goodbye, Dad. I was in excellent spirits. To drive ahead, even the loneliness seemed like a lark. But I reckoned without her. Crossing Brooklyn Bridge that morning in the rain, I saw a woman leaning against the cables. She seemed to be waiting for a lift. There were spots of fresh rain on the shoulders. She was carrying a cheap overnight bag in one hand. She was thin, nondescript, with a cap pulled down over her eyes. She stepped off the walk, and if I hadn't swerved, if I hadn't swerved, I'd have hit her. I, I almost did, almost did hit her. Now, I would have forgotten her completely, except that just an hour later, while crossing the Pulaski Skyway over the Jersey Flats, I saw her again. At least, she, she looked like the same person. She was standing now with one thumb pointing west. Couldn't figure out how she'd got there, but I thought maybe one of those fast trucks had picked her up, beaten me to the skyway, and let her off. I didn't stop for her. Then, late that night, I saw her again. It was on the new Pennsylvania turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. 
It's 265 miles long with a very high speed limit. I was just slowing down for one of the tunnels when I saw her standing under an arc light by the side of the road. I could see her quite distinctly, the bag, the cap, even the spots of fresh rain spattered over her shoulders. She hailed me this time. No, no. I stepped on the gas like a shot. It's lonely country through the Alleghenies, and I have no intention of stopping. Besides, the coincidence, or whatever it was, gave me the willies. I stopped at the next gas station. Yes, ma'am. Uh, fill her up, will you? Check your oil, ma'am? No, thanks. Nice night, isn't it? Yes. It hasn't been raining here lately, has it? Not a drop of rain all week. Hmm. I suppose that hasn't done your business any harm. Oh, people drive through here all kinds of weather. Mostly business, you know. There aren't many pleasure cars out on the turn like this season of the year. I suppose not. What about hitchhikers? Hitchhikers? Here? Why? What's the matter? Don't you ever see any? Not much. If we did, it'd be a sight for sore eyes. Why? Anyone would be a fool who started out to hitch rides on this road. Look at it. Then you've never seen anybody? Nope. Maybe they get a lift before the turnpike starts. I mean, you know, just before the tall house. But then it's a mighty long ride. Most cars wouldn't pick up anybody for that long a ride. This is pretty lonesome country here. Mountains and woods. You ain't seen nobody like that, have you? No! Oh, no, no! It was just a technical question. I see. Well, that'll be a dollar forty-nine with the tax. The thing gradually passed from my mind as sheer coincidence. I had a good night's sleep in Pittsburgh. I didn't think about the woman all the next day until just outside of Zanesville, Ohio. I saw her again. It was a bright, sunshiny afternoon. The peaceful Ohio fields, brown with the autumn stubble, lay dreaming in the golden light. I was driving slowly, drinking it in, when the road suddenly ended in a detour. In front of the barrier, she was standing. Let me explain about her appearance before I go on. I repeat, there was nothing sinister about her. She was as drab as a mud fence. Nor was her attitude menacing. She merely stood there waiting, almost drooping a little, the cheap overnight bag in her hand. She looked as though she'd been waiting there for hours. Then she looked up, and she held me. She, she started to walk forward. Hello? 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 I'd stopped the car, of course, for the detour. For a few minutes, I couldn't seem to find the new road. I realized that she must be thinking that I'd stopped for her. Hello? No, not just now, sorry! Going to California? No, no not today, the, the other way. Going to New York, sorry, sorry! After I got the car back on the road again, I felt like a fool. Yet, the thought of picking her up, of having her sit beside me, was somehow unbearable. Yet at the same time, I felt more than ever unspeakably alone. Hour after hour went by. The fields, the towns, ticked off one by one. The light changed. I knew now that I was going to see her again. And though I dreaded the sight, I caught myself searching the side of the road, waiting for her to appear. Yep. What is it? What do you want? You sell sandwiches and pop here, don't you? Yep, we do. In the daytime. But we're closed up for the night. I know, but, uh, but I was wondering if you could possibly let me have a cup of coffee. Black coffee. Not at this time of night, Missy. My husband's the cook and he's in bed. Maybe further down the road at the honeysuckle rest. No, 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 no. Don't shut the door. Listen, j just a minute ago, there was a woman standing here. Right beside the stand, a suspicious looking woman. Henry? Who is it, Henry? It's nobody, Mike. Just a lady thinks she wants a cup of coffee. Go back to bed. I don't mean to disturb you, but 
You see, I was driving along when I just happened to look, and there she was. What was she doing? Nothing. She ran off when I stopped the car. Then what of it? That's nothing to wake a man in the middle of his sleep about. Maybe she's been drinking, Henry. Young lady, I've got a good mind to turn you over to the sheriff. But I... I... You've been taking a nip. That's what you've been doing. And you haven't got anything better to do than to wake decent folk out of their hard-earned sleep. Get going. Go on. Just shut the door on her, Henry. She looked as though she was going to rob you. I ain't got nothing in the stand to lose. Now on your way before I call out Sheriff Oaks. I got into the car again and drove on slowly. I was beginning to hate the car. If I could have found a place to stop, to rest a little, but I was in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri now. The few resort places there were closed. Only an occasional log cabin, seemingly deserted, broke the monotony of the wild wooded landscape. I had seen her at that roadside stand. I knew I'd see her again, perhaps at the next turn of the road. I knew that when I saw her next, I'd run her down. But I didn't see her again until late the next afternoon. I stopped the car at a sleepy little junction just across the border into Oklahoma to let a train pass by when she appeared across the tracks. She was leaning against a telephone pole. It was a perfectly airless dry day. The red clay of Oklahoma was baking under the southwestern sun. Yet there were spots of fresh rain on her shoulders. I couldn't stand that. Without thinking, blindly, I started the car across the tracks. She didn't even look up at me. She was staring at the ground. I stepped on the gas hard, veering the wheel sharply toward her. I could hear the train in the distance now, but I didn't care. Then something went wrong with the car. It stalled right on the tracks. The train was coming closer. I could hear the cry of its whistle. Still, she stood there. And now I knew that she was beckoning, beckoning me to my death. Well, I frustrated her that time. The starter worked at last. I managed to back up, but after the train had passed, She was gone. I was all alone in the hot, dry afternoon. After that, I knew I had to do something. I didn't know who this woman was or what she wanted of me. I only knew that from now on, I mustn't let myself be alone on the road for one moment. Hello there. Hi. Like a ride? What do you think? How far are you going? Where do you want to go? Amarillo, Texas. I'll drive you there. Gee, mind if I take off my shoes? My dogs are killing me. Go right ahead. Oh, gee, what a break this is. A swell car and a decent lady. And driving all the way to Amarillo. All I've been getting so far is trucks. Ahem, uh, hitchhike much? Sure. Only it's tough sometimes, in these great open spaces, to get the brakes. I should think it would be, though I'll bet you. If you get a good pickup in a fast car, you can get places faster than, say, another person in another car. I don't get you? Well, take me, for instance. Suppose I'm driving across the country, say, at a nice steady clip of about 45 miles an hour. Couldn't a guy like you, just standing beside the road waiting for lifts, beat me to town after town, provided he got picked up every time in a car that was doing 65 or 70 miles an hour? I don't know. What difference does it make? Oh, no difference. It's just a crazy idea I had sitting here in the car. (laughs) Imagine spending your time in a swell car and thinking of things like that. What would you do instead? What would I do? If I was a good-looking lady like herself, why, I'd just enjoy myself every minute of the time. I'd sit back and relax, 
And if I saw a good looking guy along the side of the road. Hey! Hey, look out! Did you see her too? See who? That woman standing beside the barbed wire fence. I didn't see nobody. There was nothing but a bunch of steer. And the wire fence. What did you think he was doing? Trying to run into the barbed wire fence? There was a woman there, I tell you. A thin gray woman with an overnight bag in her hand. And I was trying to run her down. Run, run her down? You mean kill her? But you say you didn't see her back there, you sure? I didn't see a soul, and as far as I'm concerned, Missy. Well, watch for her the next time then. Keep watching. Keep your eyes peeled on the road. She'll turn up again. Maybe any minute now. There! Look there! Ah! How does this door work? I'm getting out of here. Did you see her that time? Did you see her? No, no, I didn't see her that time. And personally, Missy, I don't expect never to see her. All I want to do is go on living, and I don't see how I will very long driving with you. I'm sorry. I, I don't know what came over me. Please, don't go. So, if you'll excuse me. Please, you can't go. Listen, how would you like to go to California? I'll drive you to California. Seeing pink elephants all the way? No thanks. Listen, please, for just one moment. You know what I think you need? Not a boyfriend. Just a dose of good sleep. There, I got it now. Oh no, you can't go! Leave your hands off of me, do you hear? Leave your hands off me. Come back here, please, come back! <sighs> he ran for me, as though I were a monster. A few minutes later, I saw a passing truck pick him up. I knew then that I was utterly alone. I was in the heart of the great Texas prairies. There wasn't a car on the road after the truck went by. I tried to figure out what to do, how to get a hold of myself. If I could find a place to rest, or even if I could sleep right there in the car for a few hours along the side of the road. I was getting my winter overcoat out of the back seat to use as a blanket. Hello? When I saw her coming toward me. Hello? Hello? Emerging from the herd of moving steer. Hello? Perhaps I should have spoken to her then. Bought it out there and then for now. She began to be everywhere, wherever I stopped, even for a moment, for gas, for oil, for a drink of pop, a cup of coffee, a sandwich. She was there. I saw her standing outside the auto camp in Amarillo that night when I dared to slow down. She was standing near the drinking fountain at a little camping spot just inside the border of New Mexico. She was waiting for me outside the Navajo reservation where I stopped to check my tires. I saw her in Albuquerque where I bought 20 gallons of gas. I was afraid now, afraid to stop. I began to drive faster and faster. I was in lunar landscape now, the great arid Mesic country of New Mexico. I drove through it with the indifference of a fly crawling over the face of the moon. But now, she didn't even wait for me to stop. Unless I drove at 85 miles an hour over those endless roads, she waited for me at every other mile. I would see her figure, shadowless, flitting before me, still in its same attitude, over the cold, lifeless ground, flitting over dried up rivers, over broken stones cast up by old glacial upheavals, flitting in the pure and cloudless air. I was beside myself beside myself when I finally reached Gallup, New Mexico this morning. There is an auto camp there. Cold. Almost deserted at this time of year. I went inside and asked if there was a telephone. I had the feeling that if only I could speak to someone familiar, someone I loved, I could pull myself together. Number, please. Long distance. Thank you. This is long distance. I'd like to put in a call to my home in Brooklyn, New York. I'm Ronnie Adams. The number is Beechwood 20828. Thank you. What is your number? My number? Um, 312. Albuquerque, New York for Gallup. New York, Gallup, New Mexico calling Beechwood 20828. I'd read somewhere that love could banish demons. It was the middle of the morning. I, I knew Dad would be home. I pictured him, tall, white-haired, in his crisp morning robe, going about his tasks. It'd be enough, I thought, merely to hear the even calmness of his voice. 
Will you please deposit three dollars and eighty-five cents for the first three minutes? When you have deposited a dollar and a half, will you wait until I have collected the money? All right. Deposit another dollar and a half. Will you please deposit the remaining eighty-five cents? Ready with Brooklyn? Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello, Mr. Adams' residence. Hello. Um. Hello, Dad. This is Mr. Adams' residence. Who is it you wish to speak to, please? Why? Who, who is this? This is Mr. Whitney. Mr. Whitney? I don't know any Mr. Whitney. Is this Beechwood two o eight two eight? Yes. Where's my father? Where's Mr. Adams? Mr. Adams is not at home. He's still at the hospital. The hospital? Yes. Who is this calling, please?、Uh, is this a member of the family? What's he in the hospital for? He's been prostrated for five days. Nervous breakdown. But who is this calling? Nervous breakdown? But my father was never nervous. It's all taken place since the death of his oldest daughter, Ronnie. The death of his oldest daughter. Hey, what is this? What number is this? This is Beechwood two o eight two eight. It's all been very sudden. She was killed just six days ago in an automobile accident on the Brooklyn Bridge. Your three minutes are up, ma'am. Your three minutes are up, ma'am. Your three minutes are up, ma'am. Ma'am, three minutes are up. And so, I'm sitting here in this deserted auto camp in Gallup, New Mexico. I am trying to think. I'm trying to get a hold of myself. Otherwise, I shall go mad. Outside, it is night. The vast, soulless night of New Mexico. A million stars are in the sky. Ahead of me stretch a thousand miles of empty mesa, mountains, prairies, desert. Somewhere among them, she is waiting for me. Somewhere, I shall know who she is and who I am. <laughs>